I'm here today with John Simmons, who was a director of brand consultancy Interbrand, where he created the verbal identity discipline. He works with and writes about brands widely, and he's the author of We, Me, Them and It, How to Write Powerfully for Business, which has just been reissued in its 21st anniversary edition. He co-founded the Dark Angels Writing Program, which runs workshops in interesting places internationally, and he's also a published novelist and poet. So first of all, welcome, John. It's really nice to have you here. Thank you, Alison. It's good to be here. Looking forward to the conversation. I want to start with the title. So here it is, if you're watching this on video, We, Me, Them and It. If you thought that business books needed long words in the title, this, this is sort of the answer to that, isn't it? Tell us about that title and the model behind it. Uh, yes, uh, to be honest, I never quite thought of it in 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 that way that it was using short words. But you're absolutely right; it is, and I guess my thinking with this uh, started with, um, well, businesses generally weren't using words well. Let's say I'm, I'm going back to um, the beginning of the, the century, if you like, um, uh, when I was writing that book, and. Um, most most businesses, most organisations use the the third person. They talked about the business. They talked about the company. Talked about uh, you know the organisation does this, and and so it's a very simple thing. I I thought, well, why don't they talk about we instead of mm -hmm. referring to themselves in this very distancing way or of, of the third person. And so I guess I went on from there and, and, and I'm attracted to, to pronouns anyway because they're so handy when you're writing. And I put these pronouns together and out of it came a model and out of it came a, a philosophy of writing, I guess. So we, me, them and it. And... Um, so by we, I meant the corporate perspective. I, I was looking at how we write and how we could write better. And so we referring to the corporate perspective, but not in that ultra corporate way. I, I was always keen to make corporations more human than they often allowed mm. themselves to be. Uh, because I think that's very important because how do you engage with your audiences, with your customers, unless you share a, a humanity, a sense of humanity with them. So the, 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 that was we, and also the thought that each organization is made up of a number of different individuals. And so it's best, I always think, for organizations to allow the individuality of their people to be expressed, mm. which brought me on to the second pronoun, which is me. So um, uh, obviously, um, we are we are each in, individual individual human beings, but often at work we we find that aspect is suppressed. We 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 have to be the company person, and uh, but if you're to communicate effectively, I think you need to express your individuality, and if you're able to do that, you connect better anyway. And, and so, indeed. Yep. At some level, remember you're human. You have a lovely example of, of a sort of, I think it's a civil service guy. And you said, clearly no civil servant actually read this to another civil servant as a human being. <laughs> if no. they'd done so, they wouldn't have written it. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Yeah. Sorry, carry on with it. <laughs> no, no. Um, and then, well, them is, is the third of these pronouns. And, and so them is the perspective of the audience, uh, I, I guess. So mm. when you're writing, you're always writing for someone and you have to be aware of who you're writing for and so that kind of uh, awareness needs to inform the writing that you are you are doing now I, I wasn't saying use each of these three perspectives in equal proportions or anything like that uh, but an awareness of each of them is important for you to arrive at, at the fourth uh, pronoun if you like the it so think of it as the content that you write and you write it in a particular tone of voice 
and um, I guess to give you another metaphor, I, I think it's a bit like going to the opticians and you're sat there in the optician's chair and you're looking at this uh, chart in front of you with letters of the alphabet of different sizes in front of you and the optician slots in lenses into your glasses and, and plays around until you get them, you get them sharp. And mm. I, I, I think of the we, me and the, them aspect of it as a bit like those lenses that you can adjust up and down, in and out yeah. to create the best, clearest vision for the writing that you're doing. And there's an obvious metaphor about avoiding blind spots in there as well. Yeah, <laughs> love it. Yeah, but we all have those. The point about, yeah. <laughs> and the point about um, them being short words, which I sort of started with as well, I, I do think that's really important because, A, that's really memorable. And especially when you draw it in the book, you know, they've got the it in the middle with the we and the mm. them and, mm. and, uh, and me around it. Um, I was having a conversation earlier with somebody who was like, yeah, but I want it to have gravitas. <laughs> you don't, it's not the long words that give you gravitas. I mean, maybe academics believe that, but if you're in business writing, yeah, you don't yeah. need no, highfalutin are, language. Certainly not. You, need, you want to be understood and uh, you don't yeah. want to leave your readers feeling absolutely baffled either. Um, <laughs> no, don't, don't, you don't want to make your customers feel stupid. That's a <laughs> no, really, no. really bad business no. approach. Yes. No, no. And, what you said as well at the, about when you started writing the first edition of the book, which was back at the, the mm. turn of the 21st century, mm. really, um, mm. you said businesses weren't past tense using language well. Do you think that's changed? I'm not sure uh, it has. <laughs> I, I'm not sure it has. <laughs> Abject admission of failure on my part here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, apart from the ones who read your book, Ops. <laughs> Yeah, if only. <laughs> no, I, I think there's still an awful lot of room for improvement. Uh, mm. I, you, you, you must know this better than me, Alison, because you, I suspect you, you read a lot more business books than I do, and they're not all. I read a lot of business written. books than anybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and and often they, they do feel this sort of um, you know clenched approach to making the language mm. super. Mm. Mm. Graver, as I want to say, you know, mm. that, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, it's got so much gravitas, it kind of falls over under its own weight, and which, yeah. which is yeah. quite depressing sometimes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you, you, you make such a great point about. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, I was going to say, if you strive for gravitas, it just makes you sound pompous, and yes, not, and nobody likes that. It's not a good look, is it? <laughs> but sorry, it's I not a good up. look, and <laughs> and it it often, um, I think disguises or, or overlays um, a sort of lack of confidence almost mm. if you don't quite know what it is you're trying to say and really believe in what you're trying to say you mm. obfuscate with oh there I just did it look <laughs> use big words <laughs> to kind of cover up um, yeah. that you're, the, the lack of clarity uh, and people can see straight through that I think yeah, yeah. no what I was going to say was that you, you say in the book about um, and, and actually I just mentioned it with, with verbal identity as a discipline the fact that language is such an important part of brand. And I think when people think about branding, they immediately think visual elements. Mm. They think colours, brand colours and fonts and, yeah. and, and yeah. logos and so on. So tell us what you mean about language being part of branding. Well, <laughs> when um, to, to go back before Interbrand, I, I was in a company called Newell and & Sorrell and... Newell and Sorrell described itself as an identity company, agency, and it was primarily concerned with visual things. It, it was, um, had brilliant, brilliant designers in it, and those designers were creating the logos, looking at the color palette, typefaces, selecting all these visual elements with great care. And, and, and then Interbrand acquired Newell and Sorrell and Rita Clifton was brought in as a chief executive and uh, had a conversation with each of the Newell and Sorrell directors. And I was talking to her about this question. And I said to her, well, how do brands communicate if they don't use words? And, yes. and she, she had a slightly startled look uh, <laughs> with <laughs> a little bit of panic, I think, in it because... She couldn't answer the question because brands have to use words and it has to be an important part of the way they communicate. 
And for me, there is no escaping from that. So if you're going to use words, then surely you have to use the best words that you possibly can. And, and, and you have to be committed to communicating through the very best use of words that you can come up with. And so Rita nodded at me and said, OK, go away, do it. And so I set up this uh, verbal identity uh, group as it became. Uh, initially, it was just two people. It was me and one other person. <laughs> and so it, uh, we called ourselves the tone of voice group at first. Uh, but then <laughs> with two of us, it didn't seem much of a group. <laughs> and also... Uh, so tone of voice was something that I was talking about a lot, but nobody else seemed to be. And uh, in in Interbrand, it was quite a managerial kind of organisation as well. And and they they had their own bits of uh, jargon, if you like. And I thought, well, I should probably create a little bit of jargon of my own, so that uh, I can. Gain greater acceptance in 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 the. So business. they'll take me seriously. <laughs> they'll take me seriously. So uh, you know the pe people in the visual part of the company were talking about visual identity. So I simply said, well, there's verbal identity as well, and so I positioned them side by side as of equal importance, mm. and kept to it. I, I just carried on with that message and. I think eventually the the penny dropped and uh, and other people started adopting it, and it became something of a norm in the branding industry. So, what do you when somebody isn't so conscious of words as part of the um, the brand that they are communicating, the impression they're communicating to customers? What is it that they're missing? What does it matter that they have that verbal strand to the way they communicate? Mm. I, th I think they're missing. Uh, they're missing something from two different directions, if if you like. They're they're they're, they're missing uh, achieving a greater effectiveness in in the way that they communicate with other people, and particularly with um, uh, people they want to influence and, and persuade. Um, but they're also missing something from their own personal perspective because they're not experiencing the sheer joy of using words mm -hmm. in a playful way. And for me, that is absolutely vital. I think you become a better writer when you really learn to enjoy using words. You, you enjoy the very process of writing. And that then becomes a motivating thing for you to carry on getting better and better. And it, it, it becomes, a, you know, it becomes something of a, a wheel that goes round and round and it, it goes fast and fast and gets better and better uh, as you go on. Well, the, the phrase that came to me immediately as you said that is flow state. It's chick sent me high, isn't it? Is that that sense that you, when you when you're writing well, you're yeah. writing well. <laughs> the stuff that comes out of it is good, and it's good, and it makes you feel better. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the issues, and it's interesting that you call the group tone of voice group initially as well. Yeah. I have a theory that um, words have been uh, downgraded or um, or overlooked or, or sort of downplayed because it's, it's Moravian, isn't it? Who did that research that said um, only seven percent of the message is carried by the words, which of course is absolute nonsense. And you know, he mm. stood up and said this as well. Where, where mm. there's a conflict with the, with the meaning and, and what's being uh, and the tone of voice, then the tone of voice wins out. But mm. I think that so many people have kind of absorbed without question that thing that you know, language is only seventy percent, seven percent of the message. Mm. That mm -hmm. um, they've almost forgotten that <laughs> actually it's a key part of the message really <laughs> <laughs> it is uh, and even if it were true which we agree it isn't uh seven percent is still quite a sizable chunk <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot to leave on the table isn't it, <laughs> it is, yeah, yeah so uh, yeah i i don't I, I, know the tone of voice is um it is sort of strange, really. The way the way I I often explain it is it's just from a story from my childhood, really. So, um, my um, my grandmother, uh, who, who who came from a perfectly ordinary background, would come over to our house for Sunday dinner, for Sunday lunch, you know, 
and 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 we had a, a telephone which was for her absolutely new technology and yeah. her other daughter my aunt uh, <laughs> would ring while while my nan w- was there for a conversation with her on the telephone and the rest of us would sit in the, in in the room and we would overhear this conversation with an almost unrecognizable voice coming out of the mouth of my grandmother she would mm, put on a, a telephone voice own voice <laughs> and then she'd come back in the room and she'd be back, be back to being my nan again you know <laughs> uh, yeah. and, and people can put on that posh tone of voice and i think a lot of businesses do that um it's what you were saying about gravitas you know mm. why do they do it they want to make themselves in some inauthentic way sound something that they are not and 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 i think authenticity yes. is an important thing as well you have to be who you really are rather than pretend you're something yeah. that you're not well i wonder how your nan would have got on with ai because that that talk about authenticity and and also flow i think there's something really interesting about the way that so many people are delegating their writing mm. to a chat um a mm. generative um like chat gpt or something similar to that at the moment i don't do you have any thoughts on, on what they lose through that or what they gain through that indeed um yeah i i can think of a lot that they lose personally um because yeah, through the act of not doing the writing themselves exactly yeah exactly and that yeah. i i think what comes out of ai i mean i don't want to knock it too much because i'm sure it will all settle down and we'll we'll learn to live with it and we'll come to some kind of understanding of where it works best um but the the danger is that um it makes everything a bit bland it makes everything um of one level uh somewhere in the middle mm. and no doubt it improves a lot of cases of of bad business writing um but because of the way it works through through the algorithms it's a bit like making soup where you put lots of ingredients in and then mm. you you put it through a sieve and then you put it through another machine and become something that is bland and probably does you good in the sense of you know warding off hunger but is is not that tasty and and so for me as a writer you're trying to create the kind of soup that people taste and think wow that is delicious no, yeah yeah um, i i, I, I my friend used a similar metaphor that mm. the the, mm. the stuff that ai generates is this sort of uh, the cognitive equivalent of the stuff they put in chicken nuggets which i thought was a great way of putting it as well yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah it's yeah. Uh, it's just like uh, literally junk food really but uh, <laughs> yeah yeah but, they're, but they're, that is interesting yeah. because that whole the focus that you have on on me as an individual speaking to you the customer as a as a human being uh, mm. i think the people who can nail that with their human intelligence rather than artificial intelligence will have a mm. superpower in the years to come yeah i i i hope so yeah. i hope so um yes i hope so too that's what i'm betting on <laughs> <laughs> yeah well for for me i always think um There are a number of writers who've been asked this question about how do you write and how do you think and actually the two are so close together. Yeah. But how do writing I think? Thinking. I write. Sense, isn't it? <laughs> yes, I yeah. I write to find out what I'm thinking. So if I'm not doing my own writing, I'm not properly thinking. And and, and that's going to be the, the the danger of AI. We we delegate our thinking to someone else. uh but in 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 the mistaken pretense we're just delegating outsourcing a particular skill we're not we're losing the the whole ability to think creatively as part of that trade i think that's beautifully put i hadn't heard it put so well actually that's it's a really powerful articulation of it mm. i'm really interested as well in the the way that you write differently so you you obviously um professionally your 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 background is is business writing it's it's verbal identity and branding and so on mm. you're also a poet and a novelist mm. Mm. how do those interweave in your own writing mm. um yeah i love all kinds of writing i've i've really enjoyed writing my 
business books. I enjoy uh, writing for other uh, companies in in the in the branding world, uh, and 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 I love fiction and poetry, and I I I enjoy in each of those forms. I enjoy playing around with words to try to get them in the best possible structure, to get them in the right order, to put them in, in a way that is going to be as powerful as possible. Uh, and I've always loved, you know, you know, I love fiction and poetry. I do a lot of reading in, in, in that area, and I always have, and I've enjoyed observing the way that great writers write and the way they, they use mm. words. So I thought, well, why should they have it and not the rest of us? You, you know, they, they, these are great techniques that they're using and they shouldn't be confined to poetry. So you, you know, there are poetic techniques that are, are really effective. Uh, rhyme, uh, alliteration, uh, the use of repetition, the way that you create pauses, the way that you create balances in, in your writing, all these things you can learn from poetry. And I'm certainly not saying, you know, next time you've got an annual report to write, let's put it in verse or anything like that. <laughs> uh, but you can... Although... <laughs> well, it would be quite a nice thing to do. <laughs> uh, but you can uh, use the, the these techniques judiciously, let's say, to use a, a long word, uh, and, and, and select the way that, that, that you use them. And, of course, the other thing that, that, that unites all these different forms of writing is just stories. So storytelling is yes. something that is so natural to each of us in the way that we write and the way that we understand other people. Uh, and story. Our stories are really important for brands and, 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 and companies because they need to tell their stories well and they need to use words mm. as part of that. By the, by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing down the visual side of this because all my career I've worked with designers and I, I've enjoyed working with designers visually, but I've tried to make my words as visual as possible as well mm. because that lifts To create them up. pictures in the mind. Yeah, exactly, and 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 so uh, my, I I think the combination of words and images together is the most uh, powerful form of communication that you can achieve, and and mm. so, uh, let's go for that. And I love what you say about um, essentially the craft of writing that novelists poets these are people who take the craft of writing very very seriously and you can learn a lot from them which you can bring back into any kind of writing and that's a little bit how dark angels works isn't it I just, i'd love to hear a bit more about that yeah well uh, dark angels um after we made them and it i started writing other books and the third book on on writing for business that i wrote i called dark angels and um Here's an example of the way that the poetry has, has fed into my business writing because um, Dark Angel's title was really inspired by my reading of, of, of two particular writers, Philip Pullman with his um, mm. Dark Materials trilogy Dark materials. Mm -hmm. and, and John Milton, who I'd, I'd studied at, at um, university, uh, and Paradise Lost. And, and, and so... Lost, yeah. I, I, I thought, oh, Dark Angels is, is, is a lovely ringing phrase. But what I meant by it was not not the heavenly angels and not the uh, the infernal angels of uh, Milton sent down to hell, uh, <laughs> uh, but something in the middle. And what's in the middle is humanity. Here we are, mm -hmm. and we're susceptible to influence from up there or down there. Uh, but in the middle is where humanity comes in. And what distinguishes us as human beings is our creative ability. So dark angels is my code word, if you like, for human beings, because I believe that we are all creative. Often people come on, on workshops and they say to me, oh, I'm, I'm not at all creative. And I say, oh, yes, you are. We all are. And we can all become more creative if we just allow ourselves to be. It goes back to what you were saying earlier, Alison, about people having uh, lacking self-confidence. People mm -hmm. generally do lack self-confidence in their, their writing. 
So through the Dark Angels workshops I run, the main objective is to build people's confidence in their own ability to yeah. write. And, they and that enjoy. playfulness that you were talking about is so important there, isn't it? If you feel you're going to be judged, if you feel like you're performing when you're writing, there's, where's the fun in that? Yeah, yeah. And so we, we, we try very hard to, to make people feel this is a safe space. They are included. They are allowed to fail. Um, well, you know, there's that Samuel Beckett quote about fail, fail again, fail better. Uh, it. Yeah. it it's great. You can take risks in in a, a sort of safe space, Dark Angels workshop situation, and you'll be amazed at the results. I mean, people come out of uh, workshops absolutely floating on air at the transformation mm. that they're able to go through. And uh, my mission in That's life is deep. Uh, I want more people to experience that exhilaration that I feel with words. And as you were saying, you, you know, the flow, sometimes you can write and you don't notice that the time has passed. You're so deeply absorbed in it. And that's such a wonderful mm. feeling in itself. And um, let's all have more of that. <laughs> I meant to that, yeah, brilliant. I'm always scared to ask you this, but I'm also really fascinated to know what you're going to say. I always ask my guests for their single best tip. It's a bit greedy, I know, because you've given those already. <laughs> but if there's somebody, particularly in a business book situation, because that, that's really the focus for this podcast, mm, and they're mm. just starting out, and they're mm. full of the self-doubt and the fear and the, the sense that actually the words do, aren't doing what they want them to do, what would be your best tip for them? Mm. Ah... Uh, well, just trust yourself, and part of, part part of that is um, uh, this wasn't from a business book. It was from a novel. It was an, a novel by Ian Forster uh, called Howard's End, and the epigraph to it was "Only Connect." Uh, mm -hmm. He did, when when he wrote that, he did imagine that a very esoteric quiz show would <laughs> be called that on on television. Well, and weren't you the <laughs> You were the person behind uh, Sheraton Hughes putting that on their book, on their bags as well, weren't you? Yeah, was it well, Waterstones yeah. by that time? Well, it was Waterstones by that time, yeah. And it was the mm. first one I chose to go on a Waterstones bag. I, lo mm. I love the thought of people walking down the road with books inside a bag saying only connect. And that's what books do, isn't it? It's just, whether it's a business book, whether it's a novel or poetry or whatever, books are a brilliant way to connect one person to another per uh, another person in fact a whole universe of people and that's wonderful so I, I i would say my tip is only connect it's it's something i've adopted as a mantra for life but extend it particularly for for business writing world i i i, I say only persist uh because i think the need to keep at it is something that um, you need to have. You you, you need to keep mm. going, and you, you need to um, uh, keep reinforcing your own self confidence. I, I mean, think it through, show it to other people, involve other people. People are always flattered to be asked mm. if you say to them, "I've I've just written this chapter of a book. We have a read." And they will, and they'll give you good comments on it that will make it better. So only persist. Yes. And that's another form of connection as well, isn't it? It's not just connecting with the reader. It's it's connecting with people who can help you make this book better all the way mm. through the writing process. Yeah, Absolutely. Love that. Yeah. And I wonder if it's going to be E.M. Forster. <laughs> I'd like you to recommend us a book, please, John. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to recommend someone who... I think was one of the greatest business writers of the 20th century, a man called David Ogilvy. And yes. when when I read his book, I've, I've, I've got it here, I'll, I'll hold it up, is, is the unpublished... The unpublished David Ogilvy. Well, of course it was published, but originally it, 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 was, <laughs> um, <laughs> it was put together by people in Ogilvy and Mather. Uh, the business that he'd founded on his 75th birthday. And it was a collection of his writings. There were internal memos. They, 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 they were sort of 
uh, you know, a salesman's guide to selling the Arga cooker, things like this, very, uh, very business uh, situations that he, he was in. But I found it brilliant, not just in terms of inspiring me to want to write it write better, but also in terms of running a team. He's, he's absolutely mm. brilliant on that, on the way he relates to other people and is generous to other people as well. And so I, I think managers can take lots of lessons from David Ogilvy, not just in his use of language, but in his managerial skill. Yeah, it's a great recommendation. And he was very hot on writing as a key business skill as well, wasn't he? He said, that, was it the better you can write, the higher you will go in Ogilvy and May there. I mean, that's a lovely quote. Absolutely, yeah. 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 yeah, brilliant. And John, if people want to find out more about you, more about your books, more about Dark Angels, where should they go? Mm. Uh, well, there, there are two, uh, two websites, I think, uh, I, I would point people to. Uh, two writing organizations I co-founded. One is Dark Angels that we've referred to. So that'll be uh, darkangels.com. I, I really ought to know it. Uh, uh, darkangelswriters.com. <laughs> it's, it's a long time since I've had to actually put that in. in, in, in uh, if, because if you like, John, we can, you can just start. You can start that again. You can just start that again, and I can cut that bit out. So, uh, okay, so you just fine. start from there. There are two. There are two websites, and I'll yeah. do the edit. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think there are two websites for organisations that I co-founded, and the first is Dark, Dark Angels that we've uh, talked about a bit. So the website for that is darkangelswriters.com. Uh, the the second uh, organization is called 26. It's a writer's organization. Uh, Y26, well, there are 26 letters in the English alphabet. And when, uh, when half a dozen of us were getting together to form this, it just, um, and we were all writers. So it, it appealed to our sense of humor to name a writer's group after a number. And so uh, the <laughs> website is www. 26.org.uk and um, it, it will give you a, a, a lot of information about well less about my writing more about the writing of, of the members of this group who are all writers in the business world so I think people who are writing business books uh, need to be interested in in the, the very craft of writing as, as you've talked about it mm -hmm. That organisation is a way to improve your craft in a, in a very effective, easygoing way. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I will put those links up on the show notes at extraordinarybusinessbooks.com if you didn't manage to get them down just then. And John, what a pleasure it was talking to you today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Alison. I've enjoyed it. It's been good to talk to you. <laughs>